Okay, and let me turn things over to group four. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are group four. Just uh, want to apologize first that Jeff and James are going to have their microphones off as they're in the library with me. So their speaking will be picked up through my microphone. And let's get started with our presentation of the Zebra Zapper. So, Jeff, you want to go over product overview? All right. So for, for our Zebra Zapper, we basically broke the system down into three subsystems based on the customer needs. Uh, the first being the optogenetic stimulation laser path, the following two being the imaging chamber and fish holder. Um, for the optogenetic stimulation path, uh, we had a... Um, we were basically going for a simple setup on the laser path, trying to minimize the number of right angles we had. Uh, for the imaging chamber, we wanted to do something that was sterilizable mostly. And then for the fish holder, we wanted to make something that was simply functional for the customer need and their ability to remove the fish. And here's a small illustration of uh, animation of the fish holder getting inserted onto the mounting plate of the fish holder, which is mounted onto the Z translator. Now I'll take over the hedgehog concept and I know all of y'all can read, hopefully. Now the hedgehog concept asks us, what are we deeply passionate about? What can we be the best in the world at? And what drives our economic engine? One of the things that we as engineers are enthusiastic about is helping others achieve a common goal, where all of us have conceptualized to benefit others. As engineering students, we designed and built to improve efficiency and well being. Our design went through a design and manufacturing process to provide the best concept consisting of simple, interchangeable, and 3D printed parts that yield a strong economic engine with low manufacturing costs. Um, Furthermore, uh, with the study of the zebrafish, we can improve the medical field with more innovative and humane testing practices to make a more affordable and um, inexpensive research on medications. And, and as you can see, uh, we uh, pride ourselves on simplicity, low cost, and removability on this design. For the subsystem analysis, um, if anyone would like to go over the imaging chamber, more than welcome. If not, I will. Okay, so the imaging chamber is comprised of five panels of glass uh, and two edge protectors made uh, 3D printed out of PLA for mounting and also protection. Uh, the dimensions are provided and that is a customer specified dimension, uh, not able to be changed. Uh, for mounting, we incorporated these tiny mounting brackets that would be threaded onto the mounting posts that are provided in the lab. And the tank sits directly on all four corners of those, and we use four of these tiny posts. Uh, the glass was maximized for transparency and sterilizability, whereas acrylic could have been an option, but was not sterilizable with isopropyl alcohol as it would degrade and cause hazing. It also is a very biocompatible material, glass itself, obviously safe to have animals immersed in and has a lifetime product of 30 years, product lifetime of 30 years. Uh, for laser accessibility, we are testing if the laser is distorted by the glass. Uh, we chose two millimeter glass because we believe that the laser would have the least amount of distortion from the thinnest amount of thinnest glass possible. And this was what we were able to find that we could actually cut. And the cost is, extremely low, uh, very efficient, only using half a pane of glass to actually 
cut all the glass for this chamber and cents on the dollar for the material used for the edge protector. It should also be stated for the imaging chamber, we use a silicon seal and to attach the glass, to each, the glass panes to each other. And to provide a water, watertight seal. Also, just to mention on the last slide, you don't have to go back here. Uh, the, the transparency was directly, the, the, the five-sided transparent tank was a direct uh, verbal direction that we got from the customer need when we asked, we were considering doing a 3D printed tank and just putting a glass side on the laser side or the imaging side. And he specified that he wanted all sides clear so he could choose depending on what behavior he was trying to elicit from the fish, he could record from any direction. Um, for the other subsystem, the fish holder, we wanted to design an ease of convenience for the customer to remove the fish. Um, it's very delicate. We're dealing with live animals. We don't want to cause any damage to the fish. So we came up with a dovetail design where we have a hard mount on the Z bracket that it's mounted to. Um, the table itself that the zebra fish mount that the L bracket mounts to is translatable in the X, Y direction. So uh, it's a really tight fit for the tank itself on the unit. Um, and so that can translate in the X direction or what we call the X direction to the right of the imaging objective. And then from there, you can use the convenient dovetail design to remove the fish holder and ensure the safety of the fish. Uh, all the parts here are 3D printed PLA. You do have a white base plate, but the base plate will actually be replaced with a uh, three millimeter glass. Um, it's just represented here as a 3D printed part because that wasn't a part we could afford to source at the time. Um, the PLA is sterilizable with the isopropyl alcohol. It's only, it's only jeopardized at elevated temperatures. So if you're putting it in like 60 degrees C, hotter or water, then you would jeopardize the structure itself. Anything under that, it should be okay. Um, and it's PLA, so it's super rugged. It's super rugged and, sorry about that. Sorry about the mic issues, guys. This is what we're talking about, let me see. Um, so it is, it is, it can, it can go through the repeated process of being sterilized, as well as provide a uh, longevity for the project. All right, and then so for the laser path, uh, again, we wanted to provide something simple as well as using the least amount of parts. There was a point uh, with the customer need where in the beginning there is a tube lens that focuses directly before the imaging objective. And at first we identified in the very beginning from what the customer provided that was gonna be too short. So halfway through the project, we found out we were gonna need to add in another set of expanding lenses. Um, at that point, he gave us the opportunity to add in more mirrors due to the limited space that's on the table. Although what you see now in our rendering is uh, what's required for the laser path we were designing, but the whole table is basically populated with other lasers as well. Um, so what you see here is a minimal amount of components. Um, we didn't actually use the extra mirrors that he said we could. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it was pretty simple here. We just wanted to go with the least number of components, the least amount of angles that you had to tune. And, you know, we thought ease of, ease of, ugh, excuse me, ease of installment would be the best, the be best for the customer. A little bit about how this laser path works. If you see on the bottom left corner of the image, that's where the actual laser is, and it would be projected through a shutter and then reached a magnetic based mirror, which when engaged, the uh, laser is actually following a calcium imaging path, which is already, uh, uh, already set up by the previously existing uh, optical elements. But when the mirror is disengaged is when it would follow the remainder of the path here to create the optogenetic stimulation. Some key features, specifically for the imaging chamber here, we kind of already addressed was the separate mounting feet, 
which allowed it to be easily removed. Originally, we believed that the tank would be removed with the water and then dumped. But after coming into lab with the prototype set up, we realized that that space is really too tight to pull the tank out without risk of spilling water. So we came up with this either, we, we brought up to the to Charles, the customer, a solution of either using a medical grade pump, that's about $30, we found one online, or a simple syringe, which has enough, vol a 150 milliliter syringe has enough volume to fill the tank to more than halfway, which is what Charles specified is about how much water needs to be filled in the tank. Uh, to reiterate, yeah, the edge protectors are good for crack mitigation and durability. We actually accidentally dropped one of our chambers and it didn't break. So we did a drop test. Yeah. So if you look on the image, you see the screw head is off of the base plate of our fish holder. That's because the, the customer initially had a, a fish holder concept that had a thicker base plate, allowing the head of the screw to sit on that base plate. But we, we already have uh, plans to source out either shorter screws or to possibly even thicken our base plate design to allow for that the head of that screw to sit comfortably on that on that base and allow for uh, solid mounting. All right, so another key feature we wanted to go with our head shop concept was ease of assembly, uh, because you know uh, overhead is usually the driving cost of assembling things like this. So we wanted to come up with as many jigs as possible for assembly when doing this project. Um, the first was cutting the glass accurately, repeatedly. And so you can see here, we created some jigs to guide our glass cutter. And what we found out is we were actually able to consistently reproduce the same size glass over and over again to ensure that we had a nice tight fitting uh, box. The red jig you see is used for assembly. You'll see it in the top right image, as well as the 3D simulated one. That's just basically so when you put on the first piece of glass, you can tape it down into place at a right angle. And they continue to do that around during throughout the assembly. Um, and it really made it, it made it really easy. We had about a 30 minute assembly time on this thing. And I was, I was honestly surprised by that myself, how easy it was. Uh, yeah, so again, you see here where the screws don't quite sit in. Um, actually, I talked with Charles the other day. I went on to the Thor Labs website where he sources all his optics from, and we discussed sourcing some screws from there. It was like $13 for a 25 pack of quarter inch screws, which is what you want to use for this translator. Um, you can see in the middle image there where the imaging object or the fish holder isn't quite under the imaging objective. So the plate that the Z translator is on is also on an XY translator. And that is what allows the fish to be moved in and out from under the imaging objective. And then the dovetail is what enables the convenient removal of the fish safely from the, from the objective. Yeah, so not only does the XY translating table allow for the fish holder to be moved out of out of the way of the imaging objective to be removed when you're uh, adding and taking out the fish, but also is used to actually guide the fish into the laser, into the light sheet when doing brain imaging. And also Elon mentioned this previous, but the white 3D printed part on the image right now is glass in the actual design. And it's also attached with a silicon sealant to the 3D printed fish holder arm. All right, and so what you see here is we actually experimented with two different print orientations for the 3D printed parts. Um, the first image print one, where you see the arrow, the green arrow, it was that, that is the side that was, I apologize, the first image print one, the green arrow indicates the print direction. So it would have been placed, it would have been placed on the left side of that, that would have been on the base plate. Um, for print two, the top side of the fish holder where the mouse is at now would have been on the base plate. Uh, and so based on some research we did on 3D printed parts at 50% infill, we found a paper where it doesn't matter whether you're at zero or 90 degrees, the strengths are relatively the same where it changes is when you hit that plus or minus 45 print 
orientation. Um, and that's when you get a small substantial increase from approximately 50 megapascals to 60 megapascals in your print. We then went on to conduct some stress tests and see what our prints could actually hold. And so what we have here is a quick little experiment we did in our lab. You can see we have a right angle bracket at top. We wanted to conduct and see where our angle was changing as our weight increased. Um, and what we found out is that for print one, where we printed from the dovetail up towards the glass, uh, we had a weight of approximately 9,000 grams that it could sustain before it reached critical failure. That's not to say it didn't fail before that due to uh, plastic deformation. And then for print two, which is what we ended up going with, it was able to sustain a weight of 6,050 grams before reaching a critical failure. It was really cool with print two when it failed, it failed critically, the whole thing exploded. You had both failure at the dovetail. And if you look in image four there, you can see that as it fell after it exploded, the, the holder, the glass holder, the platform actually broke off as well. And so we thought that was ideal for our failure, that it was a critical failure in that way. So on the other side of the empirical analysis, we did some mathematical analysis as well. We assumed the worst case scenario, which is maximum force at the end of the glass um, holder. And a maximum bending moment stress was, a maximum bending stress analysis was done. And it was 31.5 pounds that the glass can support. The margin of safety with that number is 1.1. And the glass actually fails before the silicon seal, but the glass fails after the 3D printed arm. So it's not even a concern for the final design. Here's just a reference of how the zebrafish would be mounted or fixed in the agarist gel on the fish holder. You can see that since it's a zebrafish embryo or larva, it's extremely, extremely tiny. Even on such a small piece here, it would almost be, it's, it's almost difficult to see. Yeah, we, a weak old zebra fish is only five to seven millimeters. So we're working in a very tight range as far as our light sheet and imaging objective. And this was a customer need that he specified for the mounting platform. And that's why it's so big. Um, so what you'll see here just is the quick highlights of the laser optogenetic stimulation path and how it was calculated. Uh, basically, everything was driven off the right side here where the imaging objective or imaging platform would be underneath. Um, that was at 136 degrees angle. And then from there, everything else was 45 degrees before, besides that 136 degree angle, which drove that 45 degree angle coming off the periscope in the top left of the same image. Just some exploded views of each subsystem and an animation of how it would be removed. This is for the imaging chamber. And then this is for specifically the imaging chamber before it's fully assembled in silicone together. So how the pieces actually lay together. All four walls are the same size and are oriented to meet each other. How do you, would you explain that? Uh, so the four, the, the four side walls are oriented so basically that you have one wall butts up to the back of the next wall and then that pattern repeats itself all the way around and again this would be more convenient for uh manufacturing the process because it's just one less cut where i have to cut these two pieces to a size and these two pieces to a side and they're different so i have to create different jigs ensure that i'm cutting and i'm tracking everything with this with this setup we're able to just cut multiple sides off everything and everything's the same size, it creates a better environment for the manufacturer to not have to worry and track what they're making. Also, the, the layers, the faces in which are contacting, I, I believe added additional, uh, 
add more shear resistance to water during uh, while sealant because there it's act for each wall has a uh, shear force acting in two directions. And one of our one of our concerns was uh, the bottom seal of the tank or the bottom platform because it has the most silicone, the most silicone applied to it. Uh, so the bottom edge protector is actually extending one millimeter past where the seal would go and that's silicone on. So Cray, you're up. Yeah, I'm awesome. recording. Thank you. And after that, we just have our cost table for the prototype. Next would be the production run. Yeah, so one of the biggest driving costs of the prototype is the fact that we have to source parts like the silicone and the glass sheets. The glass sheets, we weren't able to source a piece of glass that's the minimum size required to print the tank. We actually had to buy a two pack of glass, which is able to produce four tanks. Uh, the silicone obviously comes in bulk amounts, but you can produce multiple tanks out of it. Same with the jigs, they're a one-time print off that you can use for the duration of manufacturing. And so that's one of the reasons for the high cost of the prototype. Whereas in the production run scale, we only accounted for the actual material used and the rest would go into inventory. So for the imaging chamber glass, we would only use a half a pane. And for all the 3D printed parts, we only accounted for the cost of the actual material you used to print those parts, as opposed to the entire spool, driving our costs much lower. I got this one. Uh, for IP protection, uh, we decided to uh you know, apply to see if anything was patentable because half of us thought uh, we have something that could be patented. The other half said, no, we don't think it's patentable. So we suggested just to apply to see if it's eligible for patents. And one thing that we will do is trademark for the name Zebra Zapper. And um, this uh, trademark will be owned by one of us. So we don't have any arguments and it'll just uh, everything will be settled uh, verbally. Now for overseas protection, uh, we're not gonna apply for that because um, I think at this time we're only targeting the here in the US. So, um, and then other than that, we're gonna do confidential confidentiality amongst anyone that we talk with and or work with, with NDAs and NCAs. So we can have a tight C on this. Thank you. Yeah, so basically, in conclusion, our Zebra Zapper product uh, <laughs> is probably the best of the rest. We worked very closely with Charles, the customer, and went into lab multiple times a week to make sure that where we were working on, like what we're working on is what he wants. We actually made various changes, even last minute, to a some of our designs just from input from Charles, because in reality, he's the customer. So he, he knows what he wants better than what we think he wants. And the rest of our, our design was based on removability, accessibility, manufacturability, and obviously cost. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. If there's any other, if there's any questions, take them at this time. So just yeah, for the, oh, sorry, oh, Tom, sorry. just for the, for the benefit of the recording, because uh, folks who are watching this later won't see what happened in chat. Um, Julia pointed out that um, there's already a, a trademark for Zebra Zapper. So uh, you probably noticed that the, the team's reaction when that came through chat. So yeah. anyway, just wanted to throw that out there for the benefit of the video. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, yeah, this is Tom from uh, Northrop Grumman. Um, I want to say you, you did a, a pretty good job and, and certainly the best of, of any of the teams that I've, I've seen so far, kind of giving an impression of, you know, what your system is going to do, how somebody's going to interact with it. Um, I would have liked to have seen that all sort of, collected into one spot but throughout the presentation you were talking about you know we're, we're thinking about how do you empty the water how do you uh you know how does the uh the xy axis like you know 
how do you actually mount to that? I, so I, I like what you did there, uh, and, and that's the best that I've seen that. Um, because I'm a structures guy, I will uh, I'll ask about structures. Uh, on the analysis of the fish stick, um, you've got uh, – I think you were showing a, a margin of like 1.1 and talking about uh, like a 30-pound load. Yes. Where does 30 pounds come from? It was a maximum bending stress um, mathematical equation. Can we, yeah, jump back to that slide. So, oh, I'm sorry, was that maybe a 30 Newton load? Um, oh, no, 30, 30 pounds. Okay, so, so what you're saying is is your, the maximum stress that you could carry at the tip of, of that uh, glass piece is 30 pounds. And yes. your margin of safety, you're saying it is 1.1. So what is what is the design load that uh, that you're accounting for? I used five pounds. Five pounds. Okay. Where'd you come up with five pounds? Uh, one of it. One reason was in the email Trump sent us two nights ago. Oh man, you guys, you, a bunch of cheaters. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So so I, I appreciate. Uh, that, that that's at least uh, you know sort of filtering out and, and people are thinking about things. Um, I, I would definitely make sure to say what you're uh, what you're designing to right. And in this case, it, it seems like you're thinking about a five pound handling load, um, which is, is certainly you know that's going to be you know probably what causes things to break in this system is handling loads. Um, you know, I I don't know. Um, you know, when, when you're showing, you know, I think it was like 20 pounds worth, I think you said like, uh, like nine kilograms or something. So that's, that's around like 20 pounds hanging off the, the edge there. Um, again, I, I think that's, uh, sort of representative of some amount of handling load. I didn't see really any analysis of, you know, that in terms of what is design loaded be. Um, but, but certainly I, I appreciate that you're thinking along those lines. Um, you were talking about uh, why you picked glass over other materials, and, and you talked about some of the, uh, you know, sort of sketched out a trade study uh, that you guys were thinking about, right? You said, okay, we can clean the glass with isopropyl alcohol, whereas other materials, you know, that's going to cause hazing. Um, and so you, you kind of like went with some of the uh, positives of glass, but I, I would have appreciated seeing like a, a layout of, you know, what exactly the trades were. Uh, for the uh, you know the various other options that you considered, um, but I, I do appreciate that you kind of included that. Um, the uh, from a structure's perspective, again, I, I appreciate that you got like some fillets sort of reinforcing underneath the uh, the bottom of the stick. Those are always nice to see, uh, and I appreciate that you considered uh, manufacturability and, and clearly gave uh, some thought to that specifically. Um, uh, so I, I think overall you've done a, a Really good job, um, and I guess the one last thing I'll, I'll ask about in the supports that you guys have those those sort of you know four supports at the corners of your tank. It looked like the holes in the top pieces were threaded. What is what are the threads doing for you there? So the posts themselves come with a thread. I'll try to find an image of it. They come with it. It comes with an 832 uh, all thread on top of the post. Now go back to the one where it shows it coming through. Mm. That one. So you can see the top of the post actually has an 832 uh, all thread that comes five millimeters out the top of it. Um, okay, so you're, you're actually screwing your little square piece down onto the, the threaded rod on the post. Correct, and we actually okay. Okay, I understand. 3D printed with the thread, so there's no post manufacturing on these parts. I don't know if he heard you or not. Yeah, can can you hear me, Tom? Yes, yes, I did. Thank you. Do we have do we have other questions or any other questions from the panel? Hi team. Hey, Julia. You knew I was going to come in with questions. Yes. Uh, okay, go back to the cost slide. Go to the prototyping one first, please.
Okay. So to begin with, this is, I appreciate the amount of detail. I would probably not have that in a presentation just because you're talking about it. And I don't even have time. I was trying to, to look and figure out some of these numbers and like three seconds later, you were gone. So I was like, ah, hold on. So I appreciate the detail. Believe me, I do. You know me, I love my numbers. Not presented in the correct spot. So question though, one of down here, it says possible to use same shipment from edge frame PLA. I don't, I'm not an engineer. What, who, how, what is this? We're using a very small amount compared to what you buy. You have to buy the PLA one kilogram at a time. And we're using grams at a time for our prints. So I think overall, we're pro if I remember right, we were using like 15 grams worth of PLA on our prints, whereas you get a kilogram at a time. So we calculated, and I'm not sure I can pull them up, but we calculated that we were able to print almost all of our parts for the production run off of a spool and a quarter of PLA. So that's where that number is coming from. Is when you're doing your prototype, do you not have, I mean, it doesn't necessarily matter because fifty dollars and a whole lot of money to spend on a, a team project like this. But do you not have lab consumables that you can use? Maybe you get charged against, but you're not buying an entire spool to print a couple of grams worth of parts. Uh, yeah, I mean, we did pull everything out of our lab here that uh, for a PLA that was already provided, but we didn't want to present a. We didn't want to mis like misconceive what we were doing and what would actually cost if someone else was trying to create this prototype, what they would have to supply. Okay. So then where is your manufacturing costs? Where are your assembly, I mean, your assembly costs? Mm. That's a great question. Yeah, because, and especially for prototyping, you probably won't have assembly costs or very, very minor assembly costs because it's a prototype. You are probably as the engineers putting it together, right? right? And this thing, you know, it may take some time to play around with it and get everything right, but the prototype, you probably won't have much assembly costs. When you get to manufacturing, if you can find someone to assemble these for free, can you please give me their contact information? Because I got a lot of work I can get done. Yes, so that's the first. And let me tell you, that, that's going to be a huge amount of your costs. Labor is expensive. Okay. So uh, go to, not the prototype, the uh, mass production, if you don't mind. There we go. Yeah. So definitely go back. That's going, to, I know it says 1558 here. You're probably going to, jump up to 30, 40 bucks, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a huge amount of your, in any business, anywhere, labor is a massive cost. Just if you want a reference, go Google how much UF spends on UF employee salaries, okay? You'll see how much labor costs. Um, so then the second question is, where's your delivery costs? Can I jump in on the first point? We yeah, actually- absolutely. We found that it would cost around $25 on average per hour to assemble mm -hmm. one of these, but I didn't find it necessary to include on the PowerPoint, but maybe that's a mistake on my side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll definitely, because that's going to, okay, so if it's 25 bucks, that's going to take it, your total up to 40, you know, 40 something. Well, so what we could have done is a do hearse analysis to calculate the time. Like I said, when I made the prototype in lab, it took about 30 minutes, but a do hearse analysis would have been more accurate. More right. I mean, that's just look, it's something to go back and look at. You know, I partly understand you guys. I'm, of course, I'm the business person. I come in from that realm. And so the first thing I always think about is what are my labor costs? That's mm -hmm. almost the number one thing when you look at costs that you look at is what is your labor costs? So, um, and then going, like I was saying, the next thing, your delivery. How are you going to get this to the customer? Obviously, the prototype you're probably in the lab you're already there fine you don't really need to you know put in the the well with the price of gas price of gas nowadays it would be like an expense but you don't need to put in the 30 cents it's going to cost you to drive from your home to the lab 
But when you start mass producing these, you know, you've got to get them somewhere. And I'm assuming this thing, while it's stable, it's also still going to be a little bit delicate. So you're going to have to pack it in something, you know, you're going to have to make sure that you can get this wherever you need to get it in one piece. Otherwise, you're going to be sending them a whole nother unit. And when that one breaks, you'll be sending a third unit. So just from that, those two big points, um, depending on, it looks like, now granted, again, not engineered, deal with me. The, the unit itself doesn't look too terribly large. So you're not going to have like. This is the size of the, of the chamber. It's, oh, this is the yeah. size. Of the chamber. So you're not going to have like a $500 delivery cost. You know, it is going to be smaller, but you still need to make sure you can pack it. Maybe again, depending on how delicate the product is, if you're going mass production, you may need to look at getting like, you know, when you get stuff in boxes, they're almost like custom foam around it. I don't even know what they call the packing thing. You may even, because it is glass and breakable things. So that going towards the foam packing, maybe going a little bit further right now than your scope, but definitely considering labor and delivery costs, both are gonna jump your prices up pretty significantly. That's it for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions we can help clarify? Sounds like you're your show, Trom. Okay, uh, so if there are no more questions, um, we can wrap it up there. I'm navigating my way through, there it is. To get to the uh, Zoom link for the next presentation. And we're, we're oh, about 15 minutes behind where we meant to be, but uh, the, the next group knows that we're gonna start a little bit late. So um, so I, I, I just wanna make two, two comments. Um, so, and both are, comments of praise. So, so one is um, I tell the, the story in, in Mech 2 and Mech 3 about the, what we used to call the, the, the Platteville stool. So, so back when I was a, a professor at the Milwaukee School of Engineering, uh, University of Wisconsin, Platteville um, is, is one of the top undergraduate focused engineering schools in the country. And, and they were a big rival because MSOE is a big engineering school in Milwaukee and uh, Platteville is, is in Wisconsin. Um, so a lot of students would sort of choose between one or the other school. But um, the, the Platteville stool is that they had a, a recurring capstone project um, where the students would literally be given like a stool. They had to design a stool, which is, um, you know, just a, a seat for your rear end and three legs. And that was it. And everybody sort of, you know, laughed at, at, you know, how silly and, you know, what a dumb project and why don't they have those students do something better. But the whole point of the Platteville stool was that the students like really dug into every single aspect of the design of that stool. And in the end they had these, you know, just incredible, perfect stools where every aspect of their performance and manufacturing and you know everything um was was considered and so it was a really you know interesting deep dive project into a relatively simple uh product um and to some extent you know this this product or this project has has evolved in the same way it started out um, much more complex and along the way the customer solved a lot of the problems that were initially articulated in the customer need statement and so the the design space kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking down to the point where we were literally designing a fish aquarium um, and so I worried quite a bit about you know whether this this project was still adequate and representative of what what we typically ask our mechanical engineering seniors to do uh, at UF. Um, but you guys, I think, knocked it out of the park. I think you you took it very seriously, even though it was a relatively simple project in the end um, and analyzed all kinds of different components and elements and, and you know, really did an exceptional job. So, um, so one is I, I appreciate you guys taking this you know, very seriously uh, and doing such a good job with it and doing so many different deep dives in so many different areas. Um, and then, and then the other thing that I wanted to say is that, is that Dr. Nimi and I have been arguing for three years now um, about whether Mech 2 students should be required to build a prototype. Um, and, and I think they should be, and he has argued that that's too much. Um, and so we've, we've never actually had, to my knowledge, at least in the time I've been here, 
um, a Mac two group build a functioning prototype. So you guys not only built a functioning prototype, but I'm pretty sure it's already in use in the customer's lab. Um, so um, I think again, you guys, you know, were really exceptional and, and just took this very seriously and worked really hard and knocked it out of the park and really set a, an example for what, um, you know, all capstone teams could achieve. Um, with you know the 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 level of of you know diligence and time management and expertise that that you guys put into it. So I just wanted to say that on the record uh, because I think I think you guys have been you know absolutely exceptional this summer, um, and I really really appreciate everything that you guys have done. Thank and now you. it's re now it's recorded, so so everyone will hear me say that. So anyway, um, thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Trom. Thank you, everyone on the panel. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Good work. Go getters. Okay. Um, so let me, oh, I don't have the recording power anymore. So I'm going to have to uh, ask you guys to stop recording. Oh, you want me to stop it now? Yes, please. My, my computer ran out of memory. Um, so I'll track you guys down later and, and get the recording and I'll splice okay. the two together. I'll, I'll just uh, post it in team.